Okay. So good, you're uh, you're doing well. Okay. So um, so let's recall what we kind of covered last time. So we have this mg. Uh, so now I want to be more specific. So this is closed, connected. Uh, Riemannian manifold. Then uh, for this Riemannian manifold, we defined uh, the heat kernel. So this was uh, called heat kernel. It, it, it's a, it, it, it's it's an analytic object that's attached to the manifold and it's metric together. It's a metric object and manifold object. So this K goes from M cross M cross R strictly positive to um, R for now. So it had to enjoy three properties. Um, one was that K is C0 jointly, C0 means continuous, right? Jointly in XYT. Uh, C2 in Y and um, C1 in T. These are the kind of mini minimal analytic conditions we need in order to get to the second condition. So the second one is that um, K solves the heat equation. The solution, uh, family of solutions of the heat equation. In the sense that uh, um, dk dt plus uh, Laplacian y k equal to zero. This is for, of course, on its domain, which is x y t. Right. That's that's the heat equation, right? And thirdly, very important initial value property that lim of k of x and as a function. So x fixed as a function of uh, y for any t uh, as t goes to zero plus, this is equal to delta x. So this was delta function at x, and the interpretation was that uh, this uh, is the density of heat, which means, which is another name for temperature in uh, original theories of heat and temperature, the density of heat um, you can consider as temperature. So yeah, so the unit amount of heat is, put on this point x. So the temperature at that point is infinite, but immediately after the point everywhere else is zero. So of course, this is a uh, fictional uh, idea, but it, it's a good idea. It's a, it's, it's a good fiction. Uh, and um, so we have this condition. As t goes to zero, um, so we discussed this a little bit last time. I think then we discuss it from point of view of uh, Brownian motion at one stage, we will say more, but uh, I think you know what's involved in this. Okay, so this was called heat kernel. Uh, well, I mean, there's another solution, another terminology for that is, is also called uh, fundamental solution. So it comes in. Uh, 
of, of, of this heat equation. I mean, okay, so, so uh, what we don't know is that uh, such an object, first of all, exists. We want to prove it. And second of all, uh, is that this object uh, is unique uh, on close manifolds, so on compact manifolds, it's unique. And as I said, there are two ideas related to this object, um, which are both important and kind of, um, they are two ways of thinking about the heat kernel. And the quality of these two approaches uh, gives the deepest results uh, about uh, geometry of the manifold from spectral point of view. Uh, so one idea was uh, that, uh, so let me write two ideas on KXY. The idea one was that uh, Actually, uh, if we have um, spectral decomposition of the manifold at our disposal, we can construct this. Uh, so one was that if um, phi i is an orthonormal basis, um, for L2 of M. Uh, so normal basis consisting of eigenfunctions of Laplace. Uh, eigenfunctions. So what we, what, of course, Laplace and of phi i equal to lambda i by i, uh, then eventually we are going to prove that uh, there is a formula here, which is k of x, y, e is going to be given by this formula, some exponential of minus t lambda i by i x, Y, I, y. And because this Laplacian is self adjoint, if you restrict yourself to real functions, you can take phi i and uh, to be uh, real valued functions. The eigenfunctions of Laplacian will be real valued. And uh, so I don't have to put complex conjugation here. But you can also work with complex uh, functions. And in that case, if you pick those, you have to put bar on this one, but here, this is okay. Okay, so this is summation over i. Now, of course, this, uh, we know that such a, such decomposition exists, right? This is a spectral decomposition of L2 of L. Uh, we mentioned in first lecture, I didn't prove it, uh, but the, the, the proof is, is available, it's, it's analytic, and not much geometry is involved in that proof. Uh, but, as I pointed out last time, if you look at this expression just like that, it's not clear at all that uh, this should be convergent for any t. And it's also not clear at all that the limit should be smooth and uh, you could do all kinds of things that you want to do, differentiate with respect to y twice, uh, differentiate with respect to t. These things are not uh, clear at all. Uh, so this is one of the things that has to be established. Uh, but a good idea is that assuming that everything is okay and works, so this is a big assumption, but let's see formally what it entails, assuming all analytic issues are resolved. Uh, you can easily check that uh, this satisfies condition two and three. Uh, then easy to check that. This K that we just wrote down, uh, 
satisfies, of course, I'm assuming that already satisfies one, you know, but this equation is two and three satisfies two and three. It's very easy. These are uh, just one line argument. Let's see what the argument is. Well, I mean, let's compute uh, delta y of k. So let's compute pk dt, for example. We are assuming that this object is in analytic and we can switch uh, summation and differentiation. Uh, convergence is rapid, everything is fine. So this is equal to minus uh, sum lambda i e to the negative t lambda i by i x by i y. On the other hand, if you look at uh, Laplacian uh, with respect to y, Okay, so this is equal to sum exponential of minus t lambda i by i x. Now Laplacian only applies to this y because this only y dependence is here. So Laplacian of phi i, we know that is lambda i phi i, so this is lambda i by i y again. And you see that uh, if you add this two things, of course you get the k d t. Plus delta y k equal to zero. So condition two is automatic uh, if these uh, analytic issues are resolved. Uh, condition one, uh, sorry, condition three is also uh, automatic. Um, so to do that, very quickly, uh, we can just argue like this. Um, okay, so three, so because a three is really equality of to this distribution, so we have to take a test function and apply both sides to that test function. So in this case, because the manifold is compact, so these functions are easy. So let phi belongs to C infinity of M, a test function. So um, now if you look at left-hand side of three, is uh, integral K X Y T phi of uh, because it's, it's it's a distribution with respect to y phi of y t volume g y over m but k is given by that expression so that's equal to uh, integral over m sum exponential phi phi i x by i y and this phi phi y t volume g y okay so uh, then what we want to do first of all I mean this all variables you can pull out and again you're switching summation and integration so this is equal to sum uh, and then e to the minus t lambda i phi i x uh, and then uh, okay so we have this product inner product of these two terms so integral over m phi i y phi y t volume g y so let's call these numbers these are the so-called Fourier coefficients of this function phi in the basis phi i of y right so let's call these guys a i so um, as t goes to zero these guys go to one so this converges to as t goes to zero to sum phi i of x a i 
All right? And this is, of course, uh, phi of x, which is uh, just the value of this distribution on the right hand side. This is equal to right hand side. Of course, I mean, here we are. This is the Fourier, these are the Fourier coefficients of this function. So this is Fourier expansion of, uh, of this function phi of x in terms of this orthonormal basis phi i. So this whole thing is phi of x. So that, that's also quite easy to, 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 to deal with. Uh, so this was, uh, this is one idea. Okay, so we have, if we can work out this, we can, if we can prove that this series is um, convergent for any t positive, the limit is a smooth, da, 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 then uh, you have constructed detail. In fact, you can show that. And so we have one expression for the Kirchhoff. So this, this expression now is extremely useful um, uh, from some point of view. Now, let me tell you why. Um, so if you restrict uh, this to the diagonal, Uh, then you get KXXT. Equal to sum exponential minus lambda I T by I X squared. Um, okay, uh, over I. So let's integrate two sides over the manifold. If you integrate, you get integral k x x t t volume g x over m is equal to uh, this integral But uh, these guys, um, so this comes out, but then these integrals are one because uh, I said that we choose an orthonormal basis, right? I said we choose an orthonormal basis. So the integral is equal to one. Now, this is uh, an object that we already know. Sum over i exponential of minus lambda i t. So this is what we call it Zm. And this is, uh, we call it partition function. So you can call it partition function. Uh, we can also call it uh, heat trace. Heat trace is this one. Notice now that this, this function is completely spectral, has uh, nothing to do with anything else except the spectrum of manifold. So this is a spectral invariant. So note, and so this is very important. Um, Zmt is a spectral invariant. So, in, 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 in the following sense, uh, i.e., if Zmt, in fact, Zmt is equal to Zm prime t for all t's, okay, of course, positive, if and only if these two manifolds are isospectral. Right, if and only if mg uh, and m prime g prime, so there's another uh, Riemannian manifold. Da, 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 da. If and only if these two, two guys are isospectral.
So that's, uh, I mean, okay, so this is quite easy, right? I mean, uh, if you, of course, if they are isospectral, I mean, these lambda i's and lambda i primes are the same. I mean, the other way around, I kind of mentioned it, I mean, sort of proof uh, in this direction that they are isospectral in this direction, that's non-trivial proof, but I mean, it's, it's easy anyhow, is that of course, if you have some exponential minus lambda i t over i is equal to some exponential of minus lambda i prime t over i for all t positive, if you have such an equality uh, and we are arranging lambda i's in non decreasing orders, right, on both sides, I mean, it's, it's elementary from here to show that, uh, in fact, lambda i is equal to lambda i prime for all i. And of course, we are ordering this with multiplicities in included. So, how many times lambda i appears on the left hand side? That's exactly the same amount of time. It has to appear on the right hand, right hand side. And that's, so that's uh, that's an easy thing, but that's that's very interesting uh, that everything now is captured in this one analytic expression, which is partition function. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. Now I said that we have um, we are going to also do a second. Um, we, are, we are going to develop a second idea for uh, this. Any questions, by the way? So we will have a second idea for this uh, heat, uh, heat kernel, which is uh, a geometric, uh, I would say, yes, kind of geometric idea. So this is functional analytic or purely analytic idea. Now a geometric idea is this asymptotic expansion. So this is idea two, is that uh, uh, we prove an asymptotic expansion with an asymptotic expansion. For K, X, Y, T. So in this approach, uh, as I mentioned last time, we are not going to get an exact formula. I mean, this exact formula here, it was because we had access, assume we have access to these quiet eyes. But uh, in reality, we don't. So, but what we construct and uh, we we'll prove that in fact, there exists a formula like this, K of X, Y, T is four pi T, the power minus n over two times uh, u zero of x and y plus uh, u one x y. Oh, that's not equal. I'm sorry. Asymptotically only equal uh, in, in asymptotic sense. In the sense I wrote down, u one uh, x and y. Sorry, t plus u two x and y t2 so on okay so these ui's are smooth functions in fact these are c infinity functions they are not unique they are not unique because um, uh, we are only assuming uh, asymptotically uh, to be true, I mean, so asymptotically as t goes to zero. So this is uh, this sense. Uh, however, if you restrict these functions to the diagonal, uh, they are going to be uni uh, unique expressions. Uh, so in that's on the diagonal, that's unique. But uh, ui of x and x, um, or uniquely determined. And in fact, U zero X and X 
is, uh, as I said, we didn't prove that u0 x and x is one. And uh, depending on what we want to do in the rest of the course, uh, in fact, it is known that u1 x and x is one sixth of scalar curvature. So this is the scalar curvature. And um, the next term um, is a sum of three terms contains uh, the full Riemann tensor, the scalar curvature, and Ricci curvature. The norms of these three tensors appear there. That's the next term. And from A3 and above, I mean U3, U3XX and above is even far more complicated, but uh, okay. So we we'll get a little bit, uh, we'll discuss that a little bit. But this is already quite good to know, and but this is for us now is the most important part. Okay. Okay, so this gives us the second expansion, which is KXXT. And uh, so let me write it down now. Okay, so I can erase this. So with the second idea that uh, we are going to do, uh, you get KXXT, as I said. Asymptotically given by a four pi t minus n over two times uh, okay u zero is your functions x x plus u one x x t one and then of course what we can do if two functions uh, are asymptotically the same these are like functions on x and t. Uh, the integral over manifold, the manifold is compact, uh, are also asymptotically the same. So integrating this asymptotic relation, you get asymptotic relation. Above over M, then we get integral K X X T is going to be asymptotic to four pi T minus n over two times integral over m u zero x x t volume x plus integral over m u one x x um, d volume, uh, I should put g, sorry, g, and then there is t and so on. So let's call this first number. So let's call this, of course, A0, and let's call this A1, and so on. So, of course, A0, by this uh, very important information that we will derive, A0 is going to be volume of the manifold, right? A0 is volume. Okay, so A0 is the volume, and A1 is uh, one sixth of total scalar curvature. Okay. A1 is equal to one over six um, S of X, uh, E volume G over M. So this quantity is uh, well known quantity, this is called total scalar curvature, of course, yeah. Okay, so we have on one side from this second idea, this expression, on first idea we have that expression, so we put them equal to each other, so we get uh, an expression for the partition function. For uh, heat trace asymptotics now is obtained like this. So let me now tell you. Okay, so let's call this uh, W star and let's call this star. So if you compare star and W star,
So we get uh, this expression that sum exponential of minus lambda i t is asymptotic to 4 pi t minus n over 2 times a0 plus a1 t plus uh, as t goes to 0. Goes to zero. So we have this uh, very, very important now uh, uh, relation uh, for the behavior. So this gives us a formula for the behavior of this uh, partition function that mt near zero. Uh, why is that so? If you look at an mt. So if you if you draw this function, it has a very uh, easy uh, graph. I mean, this function uh, is decreasing, right? Certainly, I mean, uh, at infinity, this function uh, obviously approaches to one. This is t, and this is the m approaches to one. At zero, this goes to infinity because uh, I mean these guys, each of the terms individually approaches one. So, and each term is individually decreasing. So the whole thing is decreasing. So this is a very simple behavior in a way. Uh, but uh, what we need to know is how fast this approaches to this, uh, this, uh, this approaches to zero as t goes to, sorry, this approaches to infinity as t goes to zero, and that's the behavior. So it blows up like one over t to the power n over two, where n is the dimension of the manifold. I mean, this is very, very important uh, information, first of all. And uh, second of all, I mean, this A0 is the volume of the manifold. So this is um, also, uh, as, you, as you'll see, going to be extremely, extremely important. So everything really, after we do the, that analytic uh, and geometric going into right coordinate system, driving the formulas for UI, XX, and all that, what really, at the end, uh, matters is this formula. Okay, any questions? Okay, so it looks like there are no questions. Okay, so now um, uh, let me just uh, get this. Do we know anything about this coefficient in different dimensions? For example, what happens in different dimension two or three? Sorry, say it again. Do we know some information about these coefficients in for different dimensions, like two, three, four? I mean, at least for these uh, few first dimensions. So Can we a, say anyone is zero or? You mean UIs? No, AI. Yeah, I mean, as I said, for all dimensions, we know that A zero is the volume in all dimensions, right? That's just the volume. A zero is always the volume for any dimensions. So I'm not sure what you mean. And A one is always total scalar curvature in all dimensions. Uh, A two is, there is a formula for A two. Uh, it's a sum of three squares of norms of uh, full uh, Gauss uh, Riemannian curvature tensor and Ricci and uh, scalar. But then uh, from, uh, yeah, from three and above, it gets more complicated. So I'm not sure I understood your question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, if I may, if I may ask a question. Yes. Uh, so actually two. So basically what you say is that this UIs can be obtained uh using the the uh, local behavior of like assuming we write it in coordinates and then we have like gij stuff like that 
So what you're saying is that there exists like expression for UN, which people can compute, go ahead and compute, but it gets more and more complicated, but it's yes. computable, however. Yes, it gets very, very, uh, very, very uh, complicated. I, uh, I invite you to open uh, one of my papers where we worked out these coefficients for Robertson Walker metric. Uh, so we computed with my students uh, up to term A12. And these are, um, they are amazing. And in that case, I mean, the Robertson Walker metric is not the most general metric. There's only one parameter AT. So that, that's, <laughs> so, but no, I mean, you can, uh, there are manuals uh, about these coefficients written. So up to A6, there are, uh, formulas which have many, many, many terms. Uh, but then, oh my God, uh, A10 is thousands of thousands of terms can easily pile up. Yeah, but what I'm talking about is that there is an algorithm, right? Yeah, there that, is an algorithm, yeah. There is an algorithm, that's that, right. That's interesting, I think. Like, are, are you gonna speak about this, like how? Uh, yeah. Term with when we prove uh, the result, uh, we will get to that, uh, but... Um, yeah, I mean, it's clear that there is an algorithm. Okay, okay, interesting. Okay. But, but uh, you know, to, to kind of, uh, you know, churn this, uh, this algorithm, the machine, turn it and then get results, it's very, very clunky machine. I mean, I, I can tell you it takes, uh, <laughs> yeah, certainly, I mean, there's no hope to do it anything without, without computer, but uh, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. thousands of thousands of terms. Yeah, sure. So, and my second question is that so is so these these methods the uh, so they, they they do have an extension into uh, the manifolds with boundaries. Yes. Uh, so, is is everything is gonna get like a bit more complicated or just a bit, not too much? There's okay. going to be a term like the square root here appears. For okay. Manifold, yeah, for manifolds with boundary, you're going to get term with the square root. And for manifolds uh, with corners, I'm not sure, but for conical singularities, there's going to be a log term appearing there. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's going to, yeah, to, to have some log behavior and uh, this sort of things, yeah. Okay. Uh, but for stratify the spaces i'm not sure it's worked out but there are people who are working on these things i'm not okay. an expert on that but, but these, are, yeah. these are these are good questions yeah that's that's a good point but but then again like if you have a manifold with boundary we yeah. had the intuition of heat kernel being the heat uh, that goes from one point to another yeah. but if yeah. i have a if i have a boundary like uh th this this heat that goes well i want to think about it as a brownian motion or, or maybe a heat does it like bounce back from the boundary? Yes, it does. Uh, well, actually, it depends on boundary condition. But exactly, it, yeah. It depends on boundary condition. But mm -hmm. in, uh, if it is Neumann, it bounces back. But if it is Dirichlet, it's uh, what I think Mark Katz called it uh, death by uh, heat uh, or something like that. So when you reach the boundary, it's like the particle is finished. It doesn't go anywhere. It just okay. does. It's out of the okay. picture. You just okay. reach those particles, those Brownian motions who reach to the boundary, they die. <laughs> they exactly. stop there. But then, of okay. course, I mean, the, the, there's like an infinite source of Brownian particles created at this point, and then they go, and then when they reach the boundary, they die there. But then, uh, yeah, the, so the dynamics is a bit different in that case, but the, the, the intuition is there. Okay, and one maybe final question. So is, is there formulas for Neumann boundary as well. Like I this. Yes, okay. yes. There is a yeah, absolutely. There is a book by Gilkey. Peter Gilkey is uh, the I think one of the best experts uh, from all points of view on this. He has uh, two, three book, books. So one of them is specifically about uh, this manifolds with boundary. Yeah, Gilkey's book I highly recommend. Yeah. So the family name is is spelled. Uh, how is it spelled? The last name Gilkey. Yeah. G I L. K E Y Peter Gilkey. I believe he's somewhere in um, uh, Washington State. I think. Where is it? 
Seattle, somewhere. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Somewhere. Okay. Yeah, he's a, he's a great mathematician for sure. All right. So we have uh, this. Okay. Now, before we go back to the proof of this, let's see if we can use this to prove uh, Wiles' uh, theorem. I mean, this statement. Can we use it to prove uh, Boyle's uh, theorem? I mean, in fact, we can, and that's what we are planning to do immediately because we are at the point that we can just uh, see some dividends of this approach because doing this analysis is okay, but then uh, getting the dividends here like that is, is important. So let me just uh, do that. <laughs> Okay. So I think if you are not speaking, if you mute yourself would be the best because uh, yeah, I mean, right. But of course, if you wanna talk, you should unmute. Okay, so um, proving wise law. Uh, from so this is the equation I can now the uh, so of course a zero remember uh, is uh, integral u zero x x the volume G, so this is volume of M because this function is equal to one, as I said. Uh, right. Okay. So I hear a noise here, so I'm not sure. Oh, sorry, it was me. Yeah, sorry. Oh, yes, yeah, okay. Right, no, that's okay. So if you just uh, mute yourself, then I, uh, okay, very good. Thank you, excellent. So now um, this A0 is volume and this is uh, the formula. So now we want to see if we can drive Boyle's law. So of course, Boyle's law, what was it? I mean, n of lambda, the eigenvalue counting function, uh, which was a number of lambda i's less than or equal to lambda is asymptotically given by, um, Omega n, I believe, over 4 pi power n over 2, volume of m, lambda n over 2, as lambda goes to infinity, right? Um, so omega n, volume of bn. That's uh, unit ball. In Rn. This is just another constant. Volume is the important thing here, and uh, lambda and the power of two, right? So I believe that's, uh, let me check. I believe that was the uh, Boyle's law as we, we, met it, we, we met it first. Uh, yes, four pi to the power of n over two. Yes, that's cool. Okay, so now um, the question is, so now uh, what you see here is, is the thing. We know how this series blows up at zero. Uh, with what power? With power t to the power n minus two. Because the other parts are just, just polynomial positive powers. I mean, that's, that's the term that it shows uh, dominant term near zero is this term, in other words. Okay, so but how can we get information about growth of these lambda i's? So this is a very, very delicate matter, right? I mean, uh, 
So I E um, to get the statistics of, so to speak. Uh, lambda i's from uh, basically um, behavior of this uh, generating function, partition function near zero. Near t equal to zero. That's a, that's a very, very delicate question. Um, uh, and in fact, I will tell you uh, after we do this first case, why it is delicate. Um, okay, so the, the answer to this comes from, uh, now you will see that um, the result is, we are going to use is not trivial. It's a, it's a well known uh, result, part of a well known theory. This is called the uh, Tauberian theory. So this is, um, so let me write it, it follows from, um, this um, RD Littlewood in the version that we are doing, uh, I think is used is Karamata Tau variant here. So the tau variant theorems uh, form a subject in analysis in the theory of summability theory called tau variant theory. Uh, I can tell you a little more about it uh, after we are done, but uh, so there is this vast body of results called tau variant theorems, uh, started by Tauber, um, late uh, 19th century, around 1900. And then was picked up by Hardy and Littlewood, and then was picked up by Karamata, but then uh, somehow Norbert Wiener in 1930s, he sort of uh, gave a very general account of, but it's still going on. It's, it's a huge theory of theory of solubility. The version that we need is the following version. So this is the theorem. Let, uh, E mu of lambda be a positive measure in uh, you know right half, right half line lambda positive uh, such that okay so let me put it like this r positive so one one r positive. Uh, such that, uh, so we want to have some summability conditions integral from zero to infinity, exponential minus t lambda, d mu lambda uh, is less than infinite for any t positive. Uh, for any positive, first of all, this condition. So this basically tells you, uh, you have seen this expression. This is the Laplace transform of the measure, right? So this is Laplace transform. We're saying that Laplace transform exists for all T positive of this measure. And such that, um, you have this condition. Okay, maybe I erase this now because I'm motivated this result. Limit of e to the power alpha t goes to zero plus integral from zero to infinity. Uh, exponential, the Laplace transform of the measure in your lambda mm -hmm. is equal to C. 
So this is the Laplace transform for T positive. And we are saying that the way that it T approaches, you know, the behavior of this function is of the form one over T to the alpha times C, where C is positive and alpha is positive. Now, if f of x is <clears throat> continuous, On zero one, continuous function on zero one, then you have this equality that uh, limit of t to the alpha t goes to zero plus uh, integral of zero to infinity f of e to the minus t lambda e to the minus t lambda, t mu lambda. Yes, this as t goes to zero is equal to c over gamma of alpha integral zero to infinity uh, f of e to the minus t. Uh, yeah, e to the alpha minus one, e to the minus t. So this gamma is the gamma function. Can you raise this part here also? Where um, so this uh, gamma alpha, and so this is the gamma function, gamma s of the gamma function. Uh, so the gamma s is by definition equal to integral zero. To infinity e to the minus t t to the s over t and dt. Yes, that's the definition. Or you can say t to the s minus one dt, but I like to write it like this for some reason. E to the minus t zero to infinity. So um, first of all, uh, gamma function is, is should be, I mean, is a He's the best friend of any analyst and physicist and maybe a number theorist for sure. Yeah, maybe. Uh, this is really an amazing function. This is somehow fundamental. So uh, note that this integral is convergent for real part of S positive. That's the first thing you have to realize and that's not difficult to see. Uh, note that gamma s is, I mean, absolutely convergent integral. For a real part of s positive. So we are going to work with this again and again. So let's, let me just tell you exactly uh, that that's the case. So, or, so the first domain for gamma is going to be uh, just the right half plane. Real part, this is the S plane, and this is real part of S positive. Uh, okay, so I mean, this you can see, right? I mean, the, this integral uh, at infinity is very convergent because there's an exponential decay at infinity. It's an exponential decay, right? So, and S is just a constant. Uh, so it's like a polynomial. So this cannot dominate e to the minus t, how fast this goes to zero. So this integral is convergent easily at infinity. So that's one end. The other end at zero, uh, I mean, you may wonder if uh, S is less than one, for example, if this integral is convergent, yes, it is because near zero e to the minus t is like one. 
And here is just t to the s minus one, but this is between zero and one, then in that case, of course, it's convergent. So you have this uh, calculus formula integral t to the alpha dt is convergent if, if alpha is uh, uh, bigger than minus one, less than zero. Of course, in other range as well. So that's so this is elementary, but it's very, very important to notice this to start. With. So this is the gap. Uh, second is that gamma n plus one is uh, so easy to see that gamma of s plus one is equal to s gamma of s. So this is called functional equation for gamma. Uh, again, proof of this is absolutely easy. You just, um, yeah, I mean, uh, you have to do integration by part. You do integration by part and you derive that. So um, this in particular shows that gamma of um, n is equal to n minus one type two. So the idea of gamma is that it's a kind of analytic continuation or analytic extension of this factorial function, but it's not n factorial, it's n minus one factorial or s minus one factorial. So the idea is, you should remember is gamma s is equal to s minus one factor. That's, that's, a, that's the idea, and that's why you have this. So you don't have this, uh, you know, equal to, uh, S plus one times gamma of S. It's S gamma of S because of this. Okay, so that we can also easily prove. And for now, we just need this that uh, gamma of N is N minus one factorial. <laughs> so for N equal to one, two, so on. Okay, so uh, anyhow, the formula that uh, Karamata's theorem tells us is this. That's 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 the theorem, and uh, when uh, when we come back after the break, five minutes, uh, I will prove this is all, and I will tell you that uh, how this will imply um, Weil's law, and also why this is such a lucky situation. We are extremely lucky here. I mean, uh, because we'll see that there is no way to get information about the next term of the expansion of lambdas, we don't know. Uh, nothing like this for the next term exists. So we'll discuss that. Okay, are there any questions or? Okay, so we can take a break uh, for maybe a few minutes and then we come back, record again. So, um, so this is now proof of Um, Karamata, I mean, it was hardly a little original version, but Karamata gave an extremely simple proof. I mean, my God, hardly little was proof of this result was very, very complicated. So Karamata just gave service to mankind by giving this amazing simple proof. Karamata, uh, Harvardian Um, so, what we can do uh, now, you see, it's very nice because f is continuous on this compact interval. We can approximate f by polynomials. So, using Weierstrass approximation, Uh, you can see that it's enough to prove the result for f of x equal to x n. All of it suffices to prove um, the theorem for f of x equal to x n for n equal to 0, 1. So, right? 
Okay, but then in this case, the limit of um, so here we are dealing with um, that case. So limit of um, t to the alpha as t goes to zero plus integral zero to infinity exponential of minus n plus one t lambda uh, du lambda, which is the sign. That's equal to um, um, yeah c times uh, well, c was this quantity that gave us the original integral, right? This is the yeah the way that uh, Laplace transform uh, blows up uh, near zero. It's that's of course, there is also this power t to the minus alpha being it plus. Anyhow, so this is equal to c times n plus one to the power minus alpha. I mean, proving this now from knowing that, and we replace f by uh, x to the n, so e to the minus n lambda, and then uh, that's very easy to calculate. So this is easy. Show you, but then on the other hand, um, also we can compute uh, C over gamma of alpha, uh, gamma function zero to infinity, exponential minus KT. T to the power of alpha minus one e to the minus t dt is equal to c over gamma alpha integral zero to infinity, or oh, sorry, minus one t, or e to the minus n plus one t t to the alpha t dt. This is also equal to C n plus one to the power minus alpha. So the two sides are equal. So that's um, so I'm saying from the definitions, this easily follows in this case. There's nothing to prove, really. I mean, uh, and just uh Weierstrass approximation theorem uh, gives us uh, the general result for any continuous. Error. But then, as Jeremy asked, that we are going to use this to non continuous Fs uh, by using some approximation uh, things. Uh, if for, for some functions, for some non continuous F, this works. And immediately we are going to do it now. So, okay, so now I can uh, just give this proof of Wiles theorem. Wiles asymptotic law. Um, so, okay, so now, so what this technology has to do with this the statistics of eigenvalues and this thing, you can see that the function, the partition function, this ZM function is going to be of this form for us for suitable choice of mu's, right? If we choose mu, uh, the measure in the right way, this function is going to be partition function. And if you look at it, you immediately notice what uh, measure you have to choose. You have to choose the counting measure. And for each eigenvalue, it counts number of times that that eigenvalue repeats. Or basically, it's, it's a measure that's supported on eigenvalue. It's a counting measure with multiplicities. OK, so let. In other words, I'm saying d mu lambda. I think my notation was d mu lambda, right? So this be equal to a counting measure uh, 
Now, of course, counting measure with multiplicities, I mean, not just uh, distinct points, right? With multiplicities. Uh, supported on a spectral model. Because there's nothing in this formula that tells us we shouldn't take, we are not allowed to take discontinuous measures and this sort. We, we can you can take atomic measures and I, I, that's what you're doing now, right? Supported on a spectral model. Okay. Now for uh, your function f, uh, so we are going to take a function which is not uh, continuous. So let me erase this part. So let f of x be equal to um, one over x um, or x between one here and equal to one over e and zero for x yeah less than one over e or bigger than zero doesn't matter so this is the function this is one one over x, uh, here is one over e, and then drops to zero. It's this function. Okay, so so now, uh, so we can apply this Tobelian theorem. This F as well. Um, the reason, as I mentioned, is that we can approximate this function uh, by decreasing sequence of continuous functions. Uh, yes, since we can approximate uh, this F by a decreasing, I mean, point-wise approximation is enough, right? So you just take, yeah, I mean, it's easy to see by decreasing sequence of, uh, of course, I mean L1 function, or I don't know, L infinity function, is this something? Well, I believe the lemma that gives us this result, um, Fatou's lemma or something, I'm not sure. So please check it. Is it Fatou that gives us it's one of these famous lemmas of measure theory? So we can apply this for sure now. So now what we have to do, we have to compute this integral against counting measure of the web. And that's not difficult. Um, okay, so then we get the name of t to the alpha, t goes to zero plus integral from zero to t inverse because you see this yeah uh, t inverse d mu lambda is equal to um, lemma of t to the alpha and t as t goes to zero plus So as t goes to zero plus, you have this uh, function. Um, 
Okay, so now one thing we have to use is volume of Pn. And since uh, volume of Pn, this is the unit ball, is equal to omega n, this becomes indeed pi to the n over 2 gamma of n over 2 plus 1. This is exactly the part of this covariant theorem that had this gamma function, right? So this is alpha plus one, right? So, um, so I'm saying you're done. <laughs> um, now I'm worried about this NT. What is this NT? I should have uh, N one over T here. Yeah, so if you just take lambda equal to one over t, as t goes to zero, uh, this is really the information about uh, number of eigenvalues. Yeah, I mean, this counting function, uh, if you apply your, if you apply this f to such things, because only points where Lambda is on the spectrum counts, right? So you should put T lambda equal to lambda n or lambda i for different values and then sum. So only those lambdas count. So lambda equal to lambda i over T come into the picture and this measure. So really, I mean, there is a gives us that. So what does the result? N of lambda um, this one here is, yeah, this formula that we have. So uh, it was like um, uh, omega n over 4 pi to the power n over 2. Okay, so Uh, lambda to the power of two. Um, yeah, I think I want you to com complete the well, what is left. I, I'm not sure that much left actually, but uh, somehow uh, this bothered me. Uh, now I'm not. I'm kind of. Should I change this T alpha or one over T alpha? My notes are very very concise, so. I'm, so please complete it. I mean, if if needed. Okay. So let's not. So that's that's at least the approach to um, to. Um, now did I say pi over n over two? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, any questions? Yes, I have a question. Yes. Sir. So, in oh. order to apply this Taubarian theorem, in this case, what is like a in Taubarian theorem? The the hypothesis says that uh, if if uh, limit t to the alpha of of of, of this of something, something converges to C. So, so we're looking at the rate of growth near zero, right? So in this, in, in, for our case, in the Wiles law, what is alpha and what is C? Um, well, alpha is um, uh, N over two, right? In Wiles law, because so, yeah, I mean, okay. Yeah, so that's the big question. So in Wiles law, uh, you see, um, I erased the part that I needed. You see, we had this Z M T, right? We saw that this is equal to four pi T minus N over two times A zero plus A one. So this is really C. Well, okay, I mean, C really is not that. So, 
Let me write it like minus m over two. So that was an excellent question. Thanks for pushing me to get, to give you more details. <laughs> Four by minus n over two, uh, a zero, which is the volume of n. So this is C I plane, and this is alpha. I mean, alpha is equal to n over two. And what, what is that? Remember that term in, 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 in the thing was just integral. Remember we had this uh, original assumption about, uh, yeah, about the result. So what was our assumption in this case? So, okay, so let me just get, I don't wanna waste time just. Right, so this was limit of, so the, the, the result, remember, compare this that we know from asymptotic expansion by the assumptions in uh, this limit, limit of T alpha, T goes to zero plus, this was assumption of the theorem, zero to infinity, E to the minus T lambda B mu lambda is equal to C. So I'm saying, this is now ZMT, okay? So uh, this is like C, I mean, if you, and this is asymptotic because the limit, uh, okay, is that, so it means that the, the, the ratio goes to, to one, right? And that's exactly what's happening here, okay? Right. So alpha is equal to, as I said, alpha is equal to N over two, and C is equal to this constant. Now, what is measure? Well, measure is just uh, the mu lambda, as I said, is counting measure. I mean, if you just support on counting measure, it means that uh, you're doing, this term is just sum exponential of minus t lambda i now, right? You see that, right? Uh, Did you see that? Yes, yes. Uh, yes. So, so that's that's the trick. We choose the mu, the measure to be counting measure supported on that. And, uh, but then this asymptotic expansion result from before the tau variant theorem exactly is telling us that the, the way that this function, this function is blowing up near zero is of this form ct to the minus alpha. The c is volume four by t minus n over two and alpha is n over and in, in the expansion, of course, these terms don't matter, right? Only uh, A0 matters for the tau variant term, right? Uh, yes. Um, I, 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 I have another question though, which is uh, why, why do we do the integration from zero to one over T? But what was the point of doing that? Well, the point of doing this uh, is that by doing that, we are uh, just uh, restricting ourselves uh, for each t to some range of uh, integrals. I mean, this exactly reproduces the counting function n for us. This is because, I mean, for each t, it really uh, just goes, as t goes to zero from zero range of um, <laughs> one to one over t. Only those eigenvalues are counted. And that's the counting function. Yeah, right, so that's, um, so, I'm not sure if it helps, you can also uh, read, uh, but, you, there is no more detail, but uh, read in uh, there is a beautiful book by Getzler, uh, Berlin, on where it's it's a beautiful book, and you can read uh, this uh, you know kind of maybe reading it in print, or, but I mean no more details is given, just. Uh, like a half a page argument uh, and the whole thing. It's just that. Uh, 
So yes, that's, that's the point of this function. But now let me tell you something which is uh, really amazing here because uh, let me tell you this. You see, we know how this function, so let, just think about it as your, uh, just look, what do we know? I mean, we know that Z of M, uh, sorry, Z M of T is four pi T minus M over two, A zero plus A one T plus A two T two. Okay. So if you think, if you think just in terms of partition function or heat trace, it looks like we have very good information about the way that, that this guy is blowing up at zero, not just the leading term, not just the leading term. We have also information about the next term and also the next term and so on. So this, but then we notice that this leading term, so compare this, Another thing which is much more uh, interesting for us, that's how eigenvalues go to infinity with uh, growth of uh, lambda i's. So what we discovered using this, I mean that what Boyle discovered is that lambda n grows like, uh, or, or I mean n of lambda, let me put it like this, Rules like uh, some constant times volume of n times lambda n over two as n goes to infinity. Uh, sorry, lambda goes to infinity. But of course, this is only the first term of the expansion, right? This is just the first term. So a natural question is, what is the next term of this expansion? So it is like the Taylor series, for example, I mean, there's some vague analogy. It's like a Taylor series that we are just giving the constant term. What is the next term? Is there, for example, some term like n over two minus one? It's some coefficient, what? Is there then another coefficient, lambda n over two minus two and so on? We are very, very interested in this question, right? We want to know um, exactly how this uh, n of lambda behaves at infinity. This is the leading term, this is the next term. And the thing is, this, this full information doesn't tell you anything about this part. So, except for leading term, which is directly related to this, these leading terms here, I mean, the subleading terms in lambda are completely hidden behind a thick wall. I mean, they're completely hidden from us, at least from this method. So uh, let me know it's right. So subleading terms are completely hidden. Uh, uh, from this Tauberian theory. Or hidden to Tauberian theory. I mean, think about it. We just got from leading term here, we got information about leading term here by this Tauberian theory. But there is no result, as far as I know, there is no result that just like that tells you that, okay, you can relate A2 with this coefficient, maybe A3 or some combination with this coefficient. There's no result like that. And that's really amazing. So the attempts to get information about this term and that term, so like this corrections to N of lambdas has to use totally different ideas. Uh, this Tauberian techniques, heat techniques, cannot see that. It's completely, um, uh, I mean, heat, heat methods is completely blind to this 
secondary effects, completely blind to it. So that's what I wanted to, to emphasize. So this is a, um, indeed, um, yeah, this is a kind of approach that's very good, but only for the leading terms. Uh, for some leading terms, you have to think about other ideas. Um, there are, but um, yeah, they're going to be more subtle. So, yeah, so we can discuss. Okay, I'll just uh, stop the recording and then uh, I'm going to pause.